This episode is going to be a little different from what we've done before. We're going to do it in two segments. For the first part, I'm just going to talk about the topic in much the same way that you're used to hearing me talk about things on the Nietzsche podcast, um, you know, a lecture with notes and citations. Then in the second half, uh, I'm going to talk about myself because the topic of this episode relates to my life in a very deep way. And I've just been out doing a lot of things related to the topic at hand. And I suppose I have some recent reflections that I'd like to share. I've also heard from some of you that you want to hear more about me or about my own life. So um, I guess I'll include a little bit here. The other thing I wanted to bring up in this uh, housekeeping section is that uh, I've been under the gun since I got back in town to produce episodes which you probably have noticed because this episode's coming out at the end of the day on Tuesday, or I guess Wednesday if you're your European listener. And it's because I've been so busy. Um, I've been getting them finished basically on the day of, and then I had a uh, emergency come up today, and um, that delayed things considerably. But um, I've never been in this position before um, so far with the podcast because since the very start... I've had multiple episodes prepared in advance, like multiple sets of notes. Even if I wasn't completely finished with them, you know, I would be two or three installments down the line. I was at least, you know, part or most of the way there. Uh, now, since I didn't take any, you know, time off from releasing episodes, um, and I've really tried to keep at least something coming out once per week and be super consistent with all of you, I'm in a bind where I've run out of all of my advanced materials while I was out of town. Um, because I, you know, I went through all those episodes. So I'm kind of scrambling to get work done to get ahead of myself once again. And this has been tough on the patrons because I can't give them early release episodes if I don't have them finished before the release date, which is why I need to do two things. One is put in a lot of work to get ahead of schedule again, which I'm going to try to do in the next couple days where I have some time. The second I may need your help with, um, I've uh, somewhat run out of guests for the show, new guests. I mean, I have a couple things planned that are like a couple interviews, like the plans of which are kind of inchoate at this point. And there are people that I would like to have on that I don't have the clout to get yet, right? But so this is where you come in. If you know somebody like a content creator or a podcaster or somebody who runs a philosophy channel or a writer or just somebody you know personally, in, like in academia or anything like that, um, anyone that you can get me in touch with or set me up to speak with, I'd love to have some referrals. Or shy of that, if you just know somebody you'd want me to reach out to or you'd like me to speak with, um, preferably you know, podcasters at the same level of obscurity or maybe a little higher, um, you know, recommend them to me. Even if you don't know them personally, I'll reach out to the ones that look promising. I just want to start doing more untimely reflections conversations again. And even though these are a little less popular than the main episodes, a lot of people enjoy them. And more importantly, it's, you know, it's early content for the patrons and I want to get that going again. So if you can help me by giving me a recommendation for someone you've heard of, or better yet, somebody you can put me in touch with, uh, let me know. Now, with all that out of the way, the topic today is music. Uh, the title of the episode I've gone with is The Spirit of Music, which you may recognize as coming from the subtitle of Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy. Um, you know, making the full title of that book, Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy Out of the Spirit of Music. And he went on to later change this title, which uh, we'll get to when we talk about Birth of Tragedy in more depth. So the spirit of music, that's what birthed the art form of Greek tragedy. And tragedy being the art form that Nietzsche sees as the sort of pinnacle of Hellenistic Greek culture. It be, it's the unification of apparently opposite artistic forces into a powerful synthesis through which the Greeks could confront the fundamental pain of existence discharge their all too human passions fit all of this uncomfortable uh you know human all too human into a comprehensible semi-ritualized experience and so in tragedy nietzsche sees the greatness of hellenistic greece and the need for tragedy that the greeks had 
Nietzsche sees a sign of strength because tragedy is hard. It's uh, cold. It's terrifying. It permits no fairy tale endings or denial of the suffering of existence. Rather than paint over our tragic existence with a sort of sedate illusion, Greek tragedy elevates everything terrible, uh, everything terrible about existence onto the level of a mythic dream world. And it becomes a sort of meta image. Um, I don't want to get too deeply into birth of tragedy in content this time, because as I said, we'll have episodes planned for a deep dive on that book that we'll get to fairly soon. But the reason why I wanted to start by bringing up the subtitle of Birth of Tragedies, because it's it's a wonderful place to begin a discussion of music and Nietzsche's philosophy, because, I mean, it's chronologically the first book in Nietzsche's career, which shows us that music has been a part of his philosophy from the beginning. But also, um, if, because from a philological standpoint, Nietzsche is likely correct that tragedy as an art form originally comes out of music. And so we have a direct bridge from Nietzsche's career in philology. We have a historical observation about the course of Greek society and culture, which leads Nietzsche to philosophize. In much the same way that his study of the pre-Platonics, um, you know, originally just simply because of his work in philology, leads to a secret origin of Nietzsche's philosophizing, as Karl Schlecht, I believe it was, um, put it. And so... This is sort of uh, this is the beginning for Nietzsche of his jump into philosophy. Music is a part of it, but the way that he understands music in that first work and the way that he talks about music, even though his views would evolve, and we'll talk a little bit about that shift uh, towards the end. Um, music is almost we could say the thing that brings Nietzsche into philosophy in some sense. So the original form of artistic expression that eventually became Greek tragedy was the Dionysian dithyram. Uh, in the case of the Greek comedies, it was uh, they had their own sort of lyrical form called the paean, which was uh, performed in devotion to Apollo. So these are both different forms of lyric poetry. In the case of the paean, sometimes accompanied by the lyre. In the case of the dithyram, drums and perhaps fluting. Uh, the pian is regular, rhythmic chanting. In contrast, the dithyram is performed by somebody drunk, and it's irregular. It's uh, extemporaneous. It's improvised. Or actually, I mean, really, as the Greeks might have said back then, inspired, right? And the proper way to perform a dithyram was while intoxicated, as is attested to by many Greek writers, as the playwright Archilochus said, quote, I know how to lead the lovely dithyrambic songs of Lord Dionysus, my wits thunderstruck with wine, end quote. So wine would have been seen as a means of opening oneself up to the muses by letting the ego consciousness lose its grip on the self for the time being. This eventually evolved into the Greek chorus, which Nietzsche argues in Birth of Tragedy was originally the only element involved in the performance of tragedy. Eventually, this art form took on the form most familiar with actors performing the roles. Ancient authors attest to this course of development, and thus Nietzsche draws from this. The original creative force which erupted out of Greek culture was solely musical, pure music. He says uh, in a quote we'll, we'll look at in a second, it even superseded the lyrics in lyrical poetry. That all of that which was added was merely ornamentation. And so we have the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music. And so this is from Birth of Tragedy, part six. Quote, Our whole discussion insists that lyric poetry is dependent on the spirit of music, just as music itself and its absolute sovereignty does not need the image and the concept, but merely endures them as accompaniments. The poems of the lyrist can express nothing that did not already lie hidden in that vast universality and absoluteness in the music that compelled him to figurative speech. Language can never adequately render the cosmic symbolism of music, because music stands in symbolic relation to the primordial contradiction and primordial pain in the heart of the primal unity, and therefore symbolizes a sphere which is beyond and prior to all phenomena. 
Rather, all phenomena compared with it are merely symbols, hence language, as the organ and symbol of phenomena, can never by any means disclose the innermost heart of music. Language, in its attempt to imitate it, can only be in superficial contact with music, while all the eloquence of lyric poetry cannot bring the deepest significance of the latter one step nearer to us. End quote. So we have in these words a, a profound um, admiration for the power of music, such that Nietzsche is willing to exalt it above all else in human expression, even above language. Um, and it's, but it's insofar as music has this ability to disclose the primordial pain at the heart of reality. And the way he's talking about it here, I mean, remember that he says in Birth of Tragedy, it's only as an aesthetic phenomenon that life is eternally justified. And uh, he's, this is in Nietzsche's Schopenhauerian phase. And so there's a metaphysical element to this idea that the passage almost reads as if Nietzsche thinks that music is sort of, in the, in the way that Schopenhauer makes his ontological leap, right? He makes an ontological leap by looking within himself for what he has direct experience of, and he um, extrapolates from that that the world is truly will. Um, and then Nietzsche's later uh, assessment was of, of the congenital defect of philosophers, that that's what all philosophers do. They look inward to the truths which they hold themselves to be incontrovertible, indubitable, but really they these are just relative truths or perspectival truths um, that are perhaps v obtained very strongly for that person or in a particular time and place, but cannot actually be said to be universal or uh, speaking of an ontological truth, right? Um, but it seems that here, early Nietzsche is willing to um, almost by implication place music as that character of the true world, right? To make that make his own ontological leap um, into saying that music is the true nature of reality, that life is redeemed by music or by aesthetics. Um, and so I just think that's interesting that that's where Nietzsche sees it. Although obviously, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the episode, Schopenhauer also gave, attributed a great significance to music and the power of music. But the key thing in this passage, I think, is his invoke, uh, invoking the primordial pain and contradiction. And if you want to know what the primordial pain and contradiction is, um, so first we should think about it in the Schopenhauerian sense, because that's the way Nietzsche would think about it here. It would be that the true character of reality is the blindly and endlessly striving will, which is never satisfied, uh, never satiated, always desiring. And that's what reality really is to Schopenhauer, independent of how it manifests in any particular form. Notice Nietzsche uses the same language. Um, he wants to speak of something, a true world, which is beyond and prior to all phenomena. So phenomena arise out of this um, primordial pain and contradiction. This uh, conception of reality is its why I think Nietzsche later said he conceived of the world as the creation of a suffering god. Or Zarathustra actually says it. The world would be the creation of the su of a suffering god, uh, sort of in the same way that Schopenhauer recounts in one of his essays that the Brahma made a, a, a grave error or committed in injustice in creating existence, and thus the Brahman must live within his creation as a sort of atonement for the injustice of creation itself, right? And among Vedantists, they believe in this idea to this day that all things are a manifestation of the Godhead. And so that means that we, we manifestations, right? We're all divine, incarnated into flesh, and yet we choose to continue striving and suffering, right? I mean, obviously, if we keep talking about this, it'll take up the whole episode, but I think that's a good shorthand understanding for those who are completely new of the basic picture of the world given in Schopenhauer's philosophy, which we see in his book, uh, world as will and representation. Setting the metaphysics aside, as Nietzsche himself later would, we can draw from all of that a great deal of value if we conceive of it in more figurative terms, I think. The primordial pain and contradiction in the heart of reality, if we're serious about Nietzsche's perspectivism, 
It's not something we ought to infer to be the nature of a true world in an ontological sense. Rather, the primordial pain and contradiction is within the heart of us. From the human perspective, this is what the world is. It's a statement about the human condition. I think Nietzsche would later realize this. It's we who have problems with our desires, for example, unlike the animals, because it's we who have embraced civilization. And so we need, as a consequence of that, to suppress certain feelings with our thoughts. Uh, that is to say, to delay gratification or withhold from it altogether, or, um, you know, hold certain regulations and ritual spaces for certain drives. I mean, sometimes and this has to do with impulses, which express themselves very powerfully um, and can be quite painful if we have to de deny them, right? And so, whereas Nietzsche writes, it's the natural thing for every impulse to be fulfilled immediately, uh, human beings, on the other hand, we feel this contradiction uh, within ourselves. Um, and uh, I mean, that need had to be fulfilled, right? For human ultra, ultra sociality, as we call it, to succeed. Ultra sociality basically meaning human beings binding together and cooperating in these um, massive societies that go stretch well beyond the sorts of extended kin groups that we are largely evolved to live in a few hundred people, right, on the uh, on the upper end. Um, once people start living in groups of tens or hundreds of thousands or millions, um, they become ultra-social because unlike uh, ants or other insects that cooperate on such large scales as we do, uh, they're all genetically related, right? I'm a, an ant pile, they're all um, sisters, or maybe that's bees. I, I don't remember. Same basic principle, though. Everyone's related um, so it creates that sort of, um, you know, biological, uh, link. And, uh, whereas with people, we, we cooperate with, uh, others who have no, uh, you know, genetic relationship to ourselves at all, other than like, you know, the distant one that all human beings share to one another. Um, and so for ultra socialities to succeed, you need quite a few things, um, which we'll, you know, we've talked about before in the podcast and we'll kind of come up later in the episode. But one of those things that you need is to create, uh, by necessity, this conflict within the human psyche, this ability to suppress feelings with thoughts. But the, the creation of this conflict causes all sorts of psychological problems for human beings. Um, and, oh, I mean, a lot of this is very old hat now, right? This was like the basic... Um, understanding of the psychoanalysts that launched that whole tradition. But again, that's because they were influenced by Nietzsche, right? And so anyway, this is why we often experience life as this pain and contradiction, because there's this inherent conflict that's been created by the civilizational project. Um, now, I mean, I, I could conceive that somebody might even get want to get more perspectivist about it, you know, that... Uh, we don't even have to say this holds true for all of humanity. Maybe it's just true for Nietzsche. But I would guess that it's probably true for a lot of other people out there, um, given how popular Nietzsche is, given how popular the existentialists are, given how people um, want to engage um, with introspection about the, uh, you know, the causes of the suffering of the human condition or what, what have you. Um, but so... One of the ways Nietzsche talks about this conflict, which comes out in Birth of Tragedy, uh, he roughly expresses this conflict in the contest between Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo is the god of dreams, of the plastic arts, and thus of self-knowledge, of representation, of rendering the world into an image. Whereas Dionysus, on the other hand, is about the abandonment of self-knowledge, and thus his art, on the other hand, is formless, rather than Apollo being a sort of artist of form. And, you know, the other domains of Dionysus involve wine and ritual madness. These are other ways of dissolving the self-consciousness. And so Dionysus to Nietzsche sort of represents returning man to the, the mother nature that he feels he's been cleaved away from by the project of civilization. Whereas um, Apollo, in some sense, is uh, synonymous with that project of civilization, of know thyself, all things in moderation, um, have self-knowledge such that you can self-reflect 
and therefore um, bring your ego consciousness, bring your reason to bear, your intellect to bear um, against the uh, otherwise unrestrained passions. So with all that in mind, there's that other key word in the subtitle of the book, which is also important here, uh, spirit, geist. Uh, this, of course, carries the connotation of a literal spirit, but also mind or a state of mind. This is the same way that in English we speak of the spirit of the times. And of course, we have the German loan word zeitgeist, which means exactly this. The best poetic description I've heard for the term zeitgeist, which I think approximates the way that Nietzsche is using the word spirit in this context, but the best description I've heard of the term zeitgeist is from David Lynch. Uh, he was in, it was an interview with uh, Charlie Rose, I believe, um, but where David Lynch said, you know, there there's just this thing in the air. And he's uh, describing the zeitgeist of a past time, saying, you know, there was just this thing in the air. Um, the mood of the era, right? Uh, the ideas, the beliefs, hopes, fears of the era, this thing in the air, right? This feeling in the air, the state of mind in the air, and so on. And so it's as if musical expression is that type of spiritual force for Nietzsche. And once Nietzsche leaves behind the metaphysics of Schopenhauer, right, it's not, a, we really shouldn't regard this as a supernatural type of spiritual force, because you could take that connotation from that uh, wording I've chosen. But the mindset of an era, right, this is... It's carried on the sound waves of music through the air, expressed through music. That, um, in some sense, music is the manifestation of the spirit of, of, you know, an era. Nietzsche tends to share in the belief of his oft opponents, Plato and Socrates, insofar as he agrees with them that music is the most emotive and emotionally powerful of all the forms of art. That it represents something akin to the power of a god or a muse directly seizing the audience, those who hear the music, and influencing them with an emotional state, pushing them towards an emotional state, increasing the duration of certain emotions and feelings, bringing them out, strengthening them. Um, you know, and to Plato and Socrates, that makes music dangerous. And famously in the Republic, Socrates designates which types of professions should be allowed to listen to what types of music designating the scales or rather the modes which are proper, um, you know, for soldiers and uh, for, you know, the leaders and philosophers and so on and so forth. He even goes so far as to outright ban certain types of music in the ideal republic because the types of musical expression which bring on madness or moroseness, for example, have no positive effect on the psyche and therefore they can only, like, harm people. <laughs> so... Again, you know, the point here, I, I'm bringing this up, it's not to agree with Socrates and these prescriptions. I don't think that Nietzsche does, even. But we should comprehend the fact that the ancients believed music to be very powerful. And anything that we take seriously as powerful, we have to regard as potentially dangerous. And that's why Socrates takes the attitude he does. And I know I've said this before, but... Um, people will talk about the power of art all the time, but we also, in liberal society, the idea of censoring art is anathema. Those two ideas um, are somewhat contradictory. Like if we really truly believe in the power of art, we should see it as dangerous. And, I mean, to that end, the most, uh, what would we say, the most morally zealous, the most politically zealous elements in society, whatever direction on the political compass they come from often are the ones who want to um, censor art and expression because um, I think they recognize the power of it and how that's like a battleground in the ideological landscape or something to that effect. Um, but so for Nietzsche, though, the insight here, it's not a political one. It's not even a moral one. It's the discovery something very central to his entire philosophical project, which is the Dionysian. Um, and the representation of the Dionysian, at least in his first understanding of it, comes for forth in The Birth of Tragedy. And what that what it is, it's a musical expression of a certain state of mind that was powerful enough to reshape an entire culture. 
maybe to be the thing that saved that culture and preserved it. That's because that's what he thinks tragedy did for the Hellenistic Greeks. Um, and that comes out of the Dionysian, the spirit of music. This, of course, uh, leads Nietzsche to the perhaps very motivated, or we might say biased opinion, that a cultural figure wielding the power of music could do the same thing in his own time. And obviously, at the time when he was first working all of this out, he believed that person was Wagner. We're going to cover all of this in the episodes um, about specifically about Richard Wagner. I always want to call him Richard, um, but you know, you guys forgive my bumbling through German and uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. But you know, I, I want to drill down here though on the the. It's really an earth-shattering revelation, if you take it seriously, um, or series of revelations, we might say, that there is such a thing as a shared state of mind not existing in one individual, but within a whole culture, that furthermore, this state of mind manifestly exists. We can experience it. We can point to it in some perceptible way, and the way that it exists is in the form of music. Um, now, obviously, music can also be the expression of a single individual, right? Conveying, simply conveying their emotional state to others. It doesn't have to be this like universal cultural force, but I believe Nietzsche would probably say um, that while all kinds of artistic expression are possible, in actual fact, what really happens is creative giants come along. I mean, he would have said in his early Schopenhauerian days, geniuses who reshape the culture the cultural and artistic landscape, so to speak. And then they leave everything in their wake. Uh, you know, all the artists in their wake, they, they, maybe they come along and they reshape or they add a couple ornamental things here and there, but that, you know, the great artists reap everything and the smaller artists gather up the scraps. Maybe that's another way to say it. And on the level of the great geniuses, what happens is whole cultures are affected or there are whole movements within culture that are affected. And since this creates a feeling a zeitgeist, it, or I don't want to say a zeitgeist because that's like the feeling of a time, but you might have different geists, right? Different musical geists. Genres are launched, right? Certain styles and moods become popular. I mean, in modern terms, you would say a vibe or a, a trend. And then eventually these movements uh, in culture or in music, I mean, the way Nietzsche thinks about it, especially in his early days, that he might even be saying the same thing there, Right. But eventually they die out and, um, you know, uh, then some new great artist arises and shifts the entire cultural attention, right? So I don't know the point. It's not to deny that music can be sort of a force between individual consciousnesses. I just don't want to get bogged down in that minutia. Look, Nietzsche's writing in a time post Hegel and whether he likes Hegel or not, Nietzsche in his ideas also implies the idea of a collective subject, Right. And so this is the idea that what constitutes a people is not simply like, or, or like a, a united people, right? It's not simply an ethnic or biological thing based on genes. It's not just that we have this cosmopolitan collection of atomized individuals who happen to live in the same place, but rather there's something that bonds people together on a conscious level. On an intellectual level, on an emotional level, it's like a common feeling, a common set of beliefs, and that this is what we call culture. And so, uh, and he begins to take this problem seriously. And so that's the problem that occupied Nietzsche following the birth of tragedy, which colors every essay of the Untimely Meditations, the problem of culture. I'm going to quote from Charlie Huneman uh, from his book on Nietzsche, which is entitled Nietzsche genius of the heart, where he talks about this period of Nietzsche's writing and the problem Nietzsche was trying to solve. Um, this is from the chapter entitled The Metaphysics of Culture, a section called Entertainment versus Culture, and I'm quoting here in an abridged form. I'll kind of skip over a couple sentences here and there. Quote, Culture, we might think, is a certain kind of entertainment. There's low-grade entertainment, which includes cheap novels, television, pop music, stock car racing, and pizza. High-grade entertainment, or what we might call culture, includes novels that are hard to read, foreign films, string quartets, modern dance, and so on. Now, this is totally wrong. 
I say, and not because demolition derbies are inherently just as valuable as opera. It's wrong because culture has nothing to do with entertainment. Culture is the means by which a society connects its members with the problems of being human. We already know what some of those problems are, death, loneliness, and significance. These are problems that everyone has, of course, regardless of income or educational status. The only choice we have is whether we want to face them or ignore them, end quote. So uh, just point out here, Huneman refers to these deep problems which everyone has, which we might rebrand as the primordial pain and contradiction of the human condition, which is Nietzsche's way of talking about it. But Huneman gives it a more uh, uh, straightforward or a name with a little more brevity. He calls it the impersonal. It's impersonal insofar as it's collective. It belongs to the collective subject, not just to the individual. It's, it doesn't vary based on the individual, right? These, uh, what human beings all share in common, um, I believe the Buddhists say this, right? That we're all bonded by the fact that we're all subject to death and to suffering and, uh, you know, all those things. So we all have the same problems. That's one of the ways of uh, looking at it. And he lists death, loneliness, insignificance, um, all of these things. Yeah, fine list. And uh, the point of culture for Huneman is for the personal to grab the impersonal, as he puts it. And so that's the direct conscious experience of the ego consciousness, the direct experience with that primordial contradiction. And so Huneman goes on to write in the same section, quote, there is no finer illustration of this personal grabbing the impersonal than what Rilke describes in his poem, Archaic Torso of Apollo. Standing before the sculpture, Rilke writes that although we cannot see Apollo's head or eyes, the torso must be suffused with some brilliant and mysterious power, gleaming, dazzling, glistening, for otherwise it could not reach out and affect him so profoundly. End quote. And uh, Huneman then quotes Rilke here. Quote, For here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. End quote. So while we might confuse culture for a form of entertainment, what I might call, because culture can be entertaining too, right? He says it has nothing to do with it. Um, it that doesn't mean that they can't coexist, but what, like we're talking about entertainment, we're talking about mere entertainment, something that has nothing to do with culture, meaning something which is superficial. It doesn't it doesn't break beneath the surface of the ice, you know, and d dive down into this abyss of the impersonal. It doesn't break through the walls of the ego consciousness and unite us on a personal level with this deeper understanding of the primordial pain of human life. And so, um, that's superficial art doesn't do that. Culture does. Um, and so that's what's at stake here. Culture is how we confront the most important questions of our existence or how we fail to confront those questions. And that's what's increasingly, you know, that's what begins to happen uh, the more superficial a culture becomes. When you eventually get in entertainment-based culture, if you'll pardon that self-contradictory phrase, I mean self-contradictory if we're still using the terms in the way human define them, um, but we might say a society which becomes superficial and which no longer breaks through to dealing with the impersonal, with the condition of the collective subject, right? A society that no longer has a shared thing in the air, as David Lynch calls it, no longer shares in the same zeitgeist, the same hopes, fears, ideals, and so on. A people which is no longer united by a uh, common feeling. The greater extent to which that begins to wane, the deeper and deeper into trouble we get into. And so it's perfect that Huneman brings up that dichotomy between culture and entertainment, because that's exactly the problem of culture that troubled Nietzsche during this time period, if we look at the specific concerns that he has. Because you can read the Untimely Meditations, and even though he's addressing very uh, specific problems near and dear to his time and place, on some level, they you can generalize from what he writes to things going on in our own time, right? That In some sense, they're universal. But, you know, the superficial culture versus genuine culture thing, I mean, his attitude was that German culture was or had become relatively superficial. 
And that's, so there's the problem of culture in the general sense, but he was felt that he was confronting a very specific problem of culture, which was his own, the problem of his own culture. And as we've already said, that's the role of Wagner to Nietzsche, to reverse this course, to rejuvenate the German culture. And Nietzsche probably still believed that throughout most of the writing of the Untimely Meditations, although probably not for the final one, which is ironically an essay praising Wagner, albeit, you know, with some backhanded compliments and he includes some subtle criticism in there as well. But he almost didn't publish it because he wasn't quite sure if he believed in the idea of Wagner being the cultural hero anymore. But uh, Heinrich Koselitz, uh, a.k.a. Peter Gast, helped him revise it and convinced him to publish it. Um, we're going to discuss the essay in more detail when we talk about Wagner, but Nietzsche, again, expresses this faith in the power of music. And I think his expression of faith for music in general remains firm, even if his faith in Wagner specifically failed him, right? And so uh, this is from part nine, nine of the essay. I picked this out because it's um, it's Nietzsche almost you know 10 years after Birth of Tragedy. Probably not quite that long, actually. But decent, the better part of a decade later, um, still invoking the same sort of uh, reverential uh, attitude towards music. Quote, Music succeeds in conveying the deepest emotions of the dramatic performers direct to the spectators. And while these see the evidence of the actors' states of soul in their bearing and movements, a third, though more feeble, confirmation of these states translated into conscious will quickly follows in the form of spoken word. All these effects fulfill their purpose simultaneously without disturbing one another in the least and urge the spectator to a completely new understanding and sympathy just as if his senses has, had suddenly grown more spiritual and his spirit more sensual, and as if everything which seeks an outlet in him and which makes him thirst for knowledge were free and joyful and exultant perception, end quote. Um, further down in the passage, Nietzsche writes, quote, Music prolongs, so to speak, the duration of the feeling from which it follows as a rule that the actor who is also a singer must overcome the extremely unplastic animation from which spoken drama suffers. He feels himself incited all the more to a certain nobility of bearing because music envelops his feelings in a purer atmosphere and thus brings them closer to beauty. End quote. I mean, and Nietzsche wrote about this purity of music, you know, its ability to unify the state of the soul and lift up the soul. He wrote about this as early as when he was 14 years old and still a Christian. And he maintained this reverential attitude through his many shifts in his views philosophically throughout his life. It's one of the few constants in his philosophy. Music is always regarded as of central importance to reality, just as music is a, a you know a central importance to Nietzsche's life. Um, you know Nietzsche played the piano. He composed music. He liked to improvise on the piano as well. I mean, he came from a musical family. One of the potential paths for him was that of a musical education. Had things gone a little differently, um, you know, it's possible he might have ended up attempting a career as a composer, which I don't think would have worked out well, since when he showed his music to prominent people in the music community, including Wagner, the reaction was never particularly receptive. That's a very polite way of saying that no one liked it. And in recent years, you know, some have kind of looked back and sort of tried to regenerate Nietzsche's image as a composer. I mean, I, I, I like his compositions. You can listen to them for free online on YouTube or wherever and decide for yourself. But that's why he wrote in a letter that, quote, there has never been a philosopher who has been in his essence a musician to such an extent as I am, end quote. But goes on to say that, on the other hand, quote, admittedly, I have not been a very successful musician, end quote. That's an understatement there, Nietzsche. But I'll, we'll look at another letter where he, he wrote his mother during, the, um, during his years at the university, uh, and he wrote, quote, when I don't hear any music, everything seems dead to me, end quote. And so we may have to wonder a bit about, uh, you know, this is where 
it must drive the sort of analytically minded people crazy when they learn about Nietzsche's philosophy that oftentimes when you get to the origin of some of Nietzsche's deeply held uh, beliefs or his most powerful ideas, what you find is like, for the reason why Nietzsche felt that way, uh, he was just, you know, he was just sort of gripped by it. He was just sort of smitten with this idea. He just really liked it, right? And here with music, I mean, he we see in his attitude, he, he, he ties it to the very, like, essence of what it means to be alive. And um, it, it, it you just can't help but think that this is because music was so important to him, right? Um, but there's no... I mean, regardless of what you think about it at the end of the day, um, I mean, I've, I've seen some people try to... Um, you know, maybe argue like, for example, you know, among like the string theorists, they're sort of saying that music is all there is at the base of reality, right? It's what all of reality is uh, created by these, the vibrations of these strings. Um, I think that if you see Nietzsche as someone like anticipating that viewpoint, it might be a little wrongheaded as attractive as that might be to believe as a Nietzschean, um, you know, uh, I don't know, unless you want to believe in metaphysical insight and intuition and revealed knowledge and things like that, maybe so. But we can perhaps remind ourselves here of the aphorisms in Beyond Good and Evil, uh, some of the most famous aphorisms of Nietzsche's uh, from the, I believe they're both from the epigrams section. I'll just read them one after the other. Quote, without music, life would be a mistake. And quote, in music, the passions enjoy themselves. End quote. And so in light of all we've discussed, those two aphorisms sort of reveal their profundity insofar as they're both, I mean, one of them is sort of a deep personal confession for Nietzsche. It's also an attempt to describe the impersonal, right? The, the, the universal problems of mankind that culture is supposed to address. So without music, life would be a mistake. Without the ability to confront the primordial pain and contradiction as only music can do, uh, human beings would not be able to go on living. And in music, the passions enjoy themselves. So that's the ecstasy, the rapture that Nietzsche discovered in the Dionysian um, artistic force, or what he describes in the passage that we read from the Untimely Meditations essays. You know, it brings us closer to beauty. Um, Janis Tunsil gave a lecture entitled Nietzsche, Music, and Silent Suffering that I found when looking at sources for this episode. And it was... uh, it was really good. I didn't really need anything else for the episode, but I had to kind of include this at the end. Um, this is a lecture he gave at the New School. I found the notes for the talk, and I wanted to read a couple of the ideas from the lecture. So Tunsil lists out many ways, I think upwards of 10, if I recall. Yet music has, you know, sort of in the significance of the writing of Nietzsche. And many of these uh, uses of music are, are overlapping. I want to focus on just a few of them that I think are, are key. Um, And so he says, one of the ways that music is used in Nietzsche's philosophy has to do with, quote, the idea of recovery from or sublimation of pain and suffering. Suffering and what we do with suffering is one of the fundamental aspects of Schopenhauer's philosophy and also of many religions. A tendency to deal with his own suffering at a young age and music's power of redemption may have been interlinked in young Nietzsche as he reflected on the loss of his father, who also reminded him of this invisible power. This is how he recorded it in his notes in 1858, nine years after the fact. Quote, At one o'clock in the afternoon, the funeral ceremony began with a full ringing of bells. Oh, their hollow-sounding knell will never leave my ears. Never will I forget the somber melody of the chorale, Jesu mein Zuversicht, Jesus my refuge. The organ resonated throughout the church. End quote. And uh, Tunsil there is quoting from Liebert, uh, his book, Nietzsche and Music, page 18. Uh, Tunsil continues, Suffering and how we relate to suffering remains a central theme throughout Nietzsche's works, and the connection between suffering and music via the Dionysian is clearly established in The Birth of Tragedy. In a similar way, he would call Wagner the Orpheus of silent suffering, end quote. So he goes on to talk about how music is also an aesthetic experience of the sublime. Um, you know, for the meaning of this term, it's, it was a great significance to both Kant and Schopenhauer. The word is das Erhabene in German. Um, I know I said that wrong. 
Um, but I'll just read from Tunsil again here. Quote, the sublime, according to Kant, has to do with that which cannot be presented by imagination. It has to do with the formless, the infinite, the intangible, and the grand. End quote. So Nietzsche, as a post-Kantian and as a Schopenhauerian philosopher, um, of course, influenced by both of them, and, uh, you know, the sense that both of them have of the sublime is this experience brought on by art and most powerfully by music that uh, is with Nietzsche uh, from the very beginning. I mean, for Schopenhauer, music could provide liberation from the striving of the will. And Tunsil kinds of, kind of talks about that in the quote I cited a moment ago. But that, that for Schopenhauer is what the deeper meaning of the sublime is, that it's a sense of contentment, of a rest from the ceaseless striving of the will. Um, you know, that the sublime puts you in touch with something that is in some sense beyond reason. I think that's what Nietzsche was, um, I think that's the insight he gleaned from reading Kant and Schopenhauer talk about the sublime. It's beyond our personal and individualized concerns, direct experience with something that's formless and intangible, and at the same time, beautiful and enticing. And so... Here we'll consider then, finally, how it is that Nietzsche overcomes this view of Schopenhauer in regards to music, uh, which he'd later come to regard as, you know, sort of despairing and romantic view of art. Because Schopenhauer sort of sees the need for art to be a reprieve from suffering. Uh, Nietzsche begins to look at art in a different way. Nietzsche expressed this side of his understanding of music in a letter to Hans von Bülow, the German composer, actually one of the people who insulted Nietzsche's musical ability, he told him, quote, your music is more repulsive than you think, end quote. So really, that's a harsh one. But in any, any case, uh, Nietzsche wrote in a letter to Bülow, uh, quote, of my music, I know only one thing, that it enables me to master feelings, end quote. This is a very important sentiment he expresses here insofar as it now ties music or the practice of music into the broader project of Nietzsche. Um, we discussed this at length in the episode we did somewhat recently on art and artists. Artists are chemists of feeling. That's the sort of ultimate consideration of Nietzsche on art, the final consideration. That's what we've been discussing in a large part here. Music is the art form which shapes and expresses the mood of an age or a culture or a movement within a culture or even within in individuals, right? It's the most powerful, most emotive form of art. And so in light of this, we could maybe characterize Nietzsche's position this way. Nietzsche looks on the power of music to provide ecstasis and the reprieve from the blind striving of the will, but not as a place to rest in contentment as a place to recreate ourselves. That's the true meaning of the term recreation, to recreate, to make ourselves anew so that we can take on life again restored. So we use this power of music, not to reshape a whole culture in this case, um, although we should always keep in mind that music does have this power, but to reshape ourselves, to aid ourselves in that struggle to give style to our character, or at least um, that's the example we can take from Nietzsche. He's not... Uh, I don't want to read too much into that one line in the letter. It's more that Nietzsche finds he has the ability to do this through the practice of music. It's one of the many tools to help with self-mastery. So the shift in Nietzsche's thinking as regards music, I think, is that even though the, all the elements are there from the beginning all the way through to the end of his life, the difference is in what he emphasizes. Early on, it's the rapture of music that he focuses on. as He's still primarily influenced by Schopenhauer at that time. But then he has his experience with the Greeks through studying philology, and his studies reveal to him this other power of music, or this other nuance to the power of music as a spirit, a geist, a, a force that doesn't just provide rapture from everyday life and everyday states of mind, but can actually influence and reshape states of mind. So he begins to see music in a new light, and as he drifts from Schopenhauer and later from Wagner, he abandons the metaphysical view of music, and then he abandons his cultural idealism. You might say a naive sort of cultural idealism. What is left is then the experiences he's had throughout his life, these irrefutable experiences of music's power, and the understanding of that 
Dionysian power and what it could do to the psyche. And so as his project became uh, sort of transformed and he took on this uh, quest to find the affirmation of life and self-mastery of the passions, music remains central even there, becomes a means of mastering oneself. And so throughout Nietzsche's work, we find poems, we find songs, we find lyric verses, we find the exaltation of singing and dancing. It's the means of expressing the highest, most affirmative love of life. And one of the last things that Nietzsche produces are the Dionysus Dithyrams, a return to the original form of a musical expression that birthed tragedy all the way at the end of his career. You know, it's like the very source of the spirit of music itself. Uh, Tunsil's lecture notes end very beautifully, and so I have to include it here because it drives home the point, and we'll end on this note. Quote, After Nietzsche's collapse, he was asked about his state at the hospital in Basel, to which he responded that he felt well, but that he could express his state only in music. And later, in the train to Jena, waking up from his chloral-induced sleep, he would sing the gondolier's song from Wagner's Tristan. In madness, all Nietzsche could remember was the musical collections of his life, a madness that can ultimately be called musical. End quote. All right, that's all for the lecture, everyone. Okay, story time, everybody. So I've talked about it before, but I'm a touring musician and. I recently went on the first tour that my band has done in a little over two years. And, I mean, do I have to say why? Uh, there's this thing you might have heard of that was called the coronavirus. Uh, anyway, that more or less put a put a stop to most, um, I mean, really any touring efforts or live music. I mean, like when it first happened in 2020, I mean, the first thing that happened, the South by Southwest here in Austin got canceled. Which, at the time, I mean, everyone in Austin hates South by Southwest, um, usually with a passion. Um, I mean, I know some people out there will say, everyone? And the answer to that is, yes, literally everyone hates it. Because traffic goes to hell, um, drink prices go up, <laughs> um, and there's just um, events happening all over the place. And if you're a musician then you have to have a love-hate relationship with it, which is even more complicated and even more of a burden because uh, you sort of have to do it. You, I mean, you, we don't usually go looking for shows during South By. We just get offered them. And so uh, and it's always a hassle, and it's always like you could hit a really big show, but it's usually more trouble than it's worth, even if you play some really good shows. But that being said, occasionally I've gotten a chance to play with some really big artists in really small clubs. And, um, I mean, there's nothing like that feeling, uh, to be in a absolutely packed house, um, you know, opening for bands that you've actually heard of and people are going crazy. And that kind of thing only happens in Austin during South by, but anyway, we've been, you know, we'd been working our asses off for the past eight years and no one knew how long the COVID thing was going to go for at the time. So, I mean, at first it was like, uh, everyone was kind of making jokes about it, like, oh, South by is canceled. Good. But then it really quickly became clear that this wasn't going to be over anytime soon. And, um, you know, Austin's in Texas, so it's not as if things weren't open. I mean, by the, by the time 2021 rolled around, venues were open, uh, bars were open, but the music scene wasn't really there yet mentally. The zeitgeist, right? The thing in the air. Uh, people were not ready to go out and have a good time yet. Everyone was still very concerned. Um, and I would say rightly so, especially at the beginning of the year. Although I think um, towards the end of 2021, we maybe held on a little too long with some of the restrictions. I don't want to get political here. Um, but, you know, um, for the most part, we just, I mean, I'll say this, we basically just spent the rest of 2020 once uh, coronavirus happened and then the first half of 2021 um, basically doing nothing public at all um, and so we just wrote we wrote two whole albums during that time 
Uh, and then we started sort of playing again at the end of 2021, but we hadn't gotten the chance to go on tour. And that's something, again, as I said, we've been doing for eight years and there's really nothing like it. Um, I, I don't know if I can really convey what it's like because it's the most beautiful and the most terrible thing <laughs> at the same time. Um, when you're doing an underground touring, I can't speak to how, you know, famous, uh, rich, famous musicians, what their experience is. It's probably completely different from mine, but, um, and I think a lot of people have a very, uh, like, I don't know, a false idea of what, uh, going on tour with as a musician is like, because they've, you know, heard, they have the image like of like the Motley Crue guys, you know, where it's like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and you're partying all the time. Like, yeah, you can do that if you're like fucking loaded and packing stadiums and you have a huge road crew that's taking care of everything for you all the time. But when it's just the four of you and you have to like load all your equipment, you've got to do all the driving, um, and you play a show every night in a different city. And usually we have as few days off as possible. Uh, maybe one a week. We did one a week this past time, and that's actually like a new thing for us because we're kind of getting older. <laughs> but um, in any case, so as you, um, you know, you you get into this rhythm, and it's very strange. Like once you hit two or three weeks out on the road, it really starts to mess with your sense of time because so when you wake up every morning, you wake up in a strange place. And then, you know, you eat or get coffee or whatever you need to do. And then you leave basically in accordance with how long the drive is going to be. You ideally want to get to your next destination with a couple hours to spare before you load in just to be there early um, and to leave yourself some space in case there's any um, accidents or mishaps. But, you know, usually you end up driving anywhere from like four to eight hours a day four to eight hours a day, somewhere in between there usually, especially with what we were doing, which was going to the West Coast. And so you wake up, you drive, you go play a gig. Um, usually, like for me, because I get up very early uh, when I'm at home, I take a nap after we load in all the gear. And then you play the show, and then you're out of there anywhere from you know midnight on a weekday show to two or three in the morning on a weekend. And then uh, you go get whatever sleep you can and you do the whole thing over again the next day. And so you're always waking up in a different place. Um, you're seeing different people and uh, you have different sort of scenery around you and different, um, there's nothing familiar, right? And so there's been some work done like uh, in neuroscience about memory that I think uh, is interesting in this respect. Uh, you know, just in your daily life, if you look back on if what you did for this past year, right? What was you? What did you do in twenty twenty one? If what your day consists of is mostly the same thing, like okay, you get up, go to work, you know, you have your morning commute, maybe you go to Starbucks, maybe then after that you go into work, and then you see a lot of the same people. Um, your brain is going to condense all that down. <laughs> like, it's going to, uh, things are going to start blurring together. And, uh, the, you know, one week is more or less indistinguishable from the next. And, uh, because of that, it, it, I mean, it affects the way that your memories are getting sort of filed away and stored when it's, when you're not in familiar circumstances every single day, even though the sort of the rhythm of the day is the same, um, you don't, uh, I think it affects your perception of time because of that, because <laughs> you're always in novelty. So your brain doesn't have the chance to like blur things all together. I mean, that still happens with time, by the way. Um, when I think back over the years of all the different tours we did, but, um, point is when you get like two or three weeks in, you start to feel like, well, that feels like three months ago that we left on tour. It feels like you've lived like the richest three weeks of your life. Um, and so, and the memories are very vivid the whole time. And it's an adventure. 
Um, so that's sort of what it's like, but this last one, it's, it's so, um, it's, it was such the quintessential tour for us, uh, underground tour experience because it really was beautiful and terrible at the same time. Like it really should be, um, because in some sense it was felt like the best thing ever. It reminded me, I mean, it made me really, I'd come to accept that we couldn't do this over the past two years, getting out and doing it again. Um, cause I had even wondered, is the world ever going to go back to the way it was? And getting out and getting to do it again evoked all the same feelings, invoked that same sense of adventure. And it was like, oh my God, this is great. The real world's still out there. And uh, it made me almost like feel pained about the past two years in a way that I had become numb to. That I had just sort of accepted while well, that happened. And I think that's a healthy attitude to have while something's happening is to just accept it if it's unpleasant. But it was like with retrospect, I kind of grieved for what I'd lost, right? Um, that, oh man, um, two years of time. I often think about what Nietzsche said. Uh, I forget which college he was at. Maybe he was at like the University of Leipzig. But just remember like one of his uh, journals or letters, he said he called one of his years of his life a wasted year. And that's always stuck with me of... Um, trying to not have wasted years and to really count the days and years of my life as really being precious. And, um, just the thought of a wasted year is so bad. And so again, we made the most of it, but, um, uh, it was, it was like uh, almost like bittersweet of, um, getting to do it again because it was, uh, you know, it's like when you cry, when you see somebody you haven't seen in a long time, right? I was sort of what the feeling was on maybe on a more subtle level. I don't know maybe I'm making sense, maybe not. Um, so it was great in that respect. And financially, as soon as we started, we were kicking ass. We were uh, doing really well because we were very worried because gas prices have uh, gone up significantly, um, especially on the West Coast, which is where we were going. And the West Coast of America requires longer drives. If you look at a map of the United States, and you're not from here and you're a European listener or you're from Australia or somewhere else, look at the size of the states on average on the east side, east of the Mississippi, and look how big they get. And look at the county sizes. Um, and that's because out west there's really nothing out there until you get to the coast. Now, obviously, that's not true that there's nothing out there, but um, wide, vast, wide open spaces and a lot of ground to cover between major cities for the most part. So you burn a lot more gas and it's a lot more exhausting. And so you sort of have to, every show has to be more lucrative. And once you get out to the West coast, uh, Washington, um, Oregon, California, those are all great markets. So you hopefully make a ton of money and then, you know, that subsidizes your way back. So anyway, the first sign that things, uh, I don't want to say we're going to go wrong, but well, I mean, they did go wrong. Um, the very first show kickoff show, we're supposed to play with this band called Monolord from Sweden. And, uh, they're, they're one of my favorite bands. I, I love this band. It would have been wonderful just to see that band for free, but to get to play with them, that's amazing. Um, first thing we hear that day, their van broke down. They're not going to make the show. So we sort of slapped together a combined show out of the shows that were supposed to go on the inside and the outside stage. It still goes great. A ton of people showed up and they, they told us it was one of the best shows they had had that whole time during South by or compared to cause South by Southwest went on again this year. And, uh, we played the week after, which is normally like dead in Austin. And uh, people still came out, but it was like, wow, that's not a very promising start. And I try not to think superstitiously because I feel like you almost jinx yourself if you believe in that kind of crap. But I did. The thought crossed my mind and we talked about it of like, oh, great. This tour is getting off to a, a great start because we've had other tours where things have happened on day one that sort of set the tone for the whole experience. And, uh, that definitely was true here, 
but it was also indicative of how the tour went because we just kept going by the skin of our teeth. So the other thing that happened the next two days of the, the tour, um, those shows basically fell through and it was almost that the first two shows out on the road would have been canceled and we would have just not played them. Somehow our agent gets these shows together again and we have, um, and, and some of us put in some work too. And suddenly we have two shows that are like, uh, working again. Great. We get out on the road and again, like I said, we're doing great. Um, we get to Denver, we have a killer night. Um, we're staying with our friend and our drummer whose van it is, he goes over to get the, uh, oil changed. Um, you know, probably a small detail. Oh, I left out on the way to Albuquerque. We blow a trailer tire out on I-10. That's also, you know, um, uh, oh wait, no, that wasn't on I-10. It, it was in, it was in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, not a good place to blow a tire. Thankfully we have a spare. Um, so we put it on, we go buy a new spare. Um, we show up at the venue in time to load in. So it's like, great. Another problem, tackled it, overcome it. We're good. Get to Denver, go get the oil changed on the van. Then we had to drive, um, after that weekend, basically for two days for 16 hours to get all the way up to Moscow, Idaho. And we drove across Montana. It's beautiful out there. It's gorgeous. Um, everything's fine with the van. Things are going great. We get over to the West coast. We're playing Seattle. We're playing Portland. Uh, and then on the road to our show in Oakland, we're climbing up this really steep grade, these mountains, uh, outside of Ashland, Oregon, which is a town, li- little, 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 little small town on the, um, sort of just north of the border with California. So Southern Oregon, very granola town, very, uh, you know, one of those little hippie towns. <laughs> so, um, we stopped there just to eat and then, uh, we're going up the mountain. The van starts smoking. We smell oil. Uh, van starts beeping. We pull off to the side. Uh, oil's bone dry. So what the hell happened? We got it changed like six days ago, but, um, we're all horrified because that's really bad. If you know anything about cars. And so we had a quart of oil and we put it in there and, uh, I was thinking we're going to get through this by the skin of our teeth again, but no thing won't start. It's completely seized up. And so we're now on the side of the road, like 10 miles from this, the, you know, the largest town is a tiny little town and, uh, we're on the side of a mountain and, uh, half of us don't have cell service and, uh, we're waiting for a tow, but by then it's already three or four. It was like three in the afternoon and, um, you know, the mechanics we're calling are basically telling us we probably won't be able to get to it today. And the real one, two punch to the gut is this is Friday night. This is supposed to be our Friday night in Oakland. That's like the San Francisco area. Um, and that was set to be an amazing show. And we're realizing very slowly as we're sitting there, uh, not only are we not going to make the show, if we don't get the van to a mechanic, um, you know, before 6 PM today, no one's going to be able to do any work on it all weekend. And then we'll be, I mean, basically at that point, the tour's kind of fucked. And, I mean, I kind of knew in the pit of my stomach even then that the chances of somebody fixing the van, I mean, if the engine seized, it seized. That That's the death of your engine. Um, and of course, at the time, we're thinking this mechanic fucked us over. They didn't put seal the cap properly. There was something cross-threaded. There was something wrong. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about cars, but um, it just didn't make sense if we've never had this issue before and it was oil changed six days ago and now it's completely empty. And we had just gone through, you know, Montana and everything. Um, there didn't seem to be any sign of an oil leak. 
Um, so eventually we get it towed to a mechanic and, you know, they're not going to be able to look at it until tomorrow, but we're all sort of figuring the van's likely dead. And so we're stuck in this little town for the night. Um, so we got drunk, uh, went out on the town, uh, went out to an Irish pub, tried to make the most of it. And, uh, the next day, of course, we find out that, yeah, it's not uh, salvageable. You're going to have to rebuild the whole engine and it's going to be about two weeks. But for some reason, uh, we had a really foolish, uh, sense of optimism or just, I don't know what uh, principle. Uh, I mean, basically we were like, we're not going to let this stop us. We're going to keep finishing the tour and we'll leave the van here. We just have to rent a vehicle. Um, a part of it though is just practical, right? Because now we're facing like an eight or $9,000 expense. that's going to basically blow the tour out financially. We're not going to make any money. We're not going to break even. We're not even going to come close to breaking even, but we have to make all the money that we can and we have to get home somehow. We can either pay our way home by playing shows and selling things, AKA sing for your supper um, right. Or we can just pack up and go home. We should play. We should, I mean, this is what we're out here to do. Um, that loss has already happened. We just sort of have to accept it. And, um, the best way to get home is to keep touring. So it's actually probably the smartest thing to do. Um, I guess really the difference is a lot of people, like if that was our first tour, we'd probably be ready to strangle it, each other. Um, if we weren't so like ecstatic to be back on the road again, performing live music every single night, um, and, you know, meeting new people and seeing new places and just uh, the adventure of it all. Um, if we weren't so thrilled to have that after two years of not having it, um, after getting addicted for eight years, maybe we would have had, had a different attitude. I don't know. Anyway, in this town, um, there's not many options for vehicle rental. We actually had to go to a place two towns away. And the only thing we can get is a U-Haul uh, box truck. It's like a 10-foot truck. Um, and that means there's a uh, passenger space for like two people. Um, the reason we got it is because we just needed to have space for four people. We needed some vehicle that can hold four people and it has to be able to tow. Nothing people had to tow had any more space than that for passengers and, um, or they wouldn't let us take it out of state. And so we're sort of facing the reality like, okay, we're going to have to finish this tour in a box truck, which means two people are going to have to ride in the back. And because we missed the show in Oakland, and at that point, by the time we got everything settled and got our vehicle and we're ready to get on the on the road, hitch the trailer to it and everything, you know, it was already like three or four in the afternoon. There was no way we were going to make it to LA to play that show. So we basically <laughs> lost our Friday and Saturday show. And the next show's in San Diego. So we're at, you know a stone's throw away from the California border to the north. San Diego is right over the border from Mexico on the south part of California. So long story short, I rode for 14 hours in the back of that thing. And it was very loud. <laughs> it's not airtight. And you feel every last bump in the road. It's not exactly legal either, but it's already over. So no one can you know get us for it. Um, and it was not as bad as you would think it was. Um, you know, we, you can have a light on in there. Um, we basically, if you have the dome light on in the passenger cabin, it'll be on in the back. So we just taped it over in the passenger cabin. But when it, when it was nighttime and we wanted to go to sleep because we laid out like all our, all our foam padding from the bed that we had built in the uh, van in the drummer's van. We just moved all that back there. We had all our sleeping bags. We had all, all our pillows. So we we're just laying down. Uh, you turn out the lights in there. Yeah, it's real dark. But, uh, you know, you're laying down as loud as it is. If you're tired enough and, uh, you know, you drank enough, <laughs> you can go to sleep. And it actually was not that bad. Um, the only thing was after San Diego, 
uh, we were heading to Las Vegas and that brought us into the desert. And so the, the next dates were like Vegas, um, Phoenix, Bisbee, Arizona, that's in Southern Arizona, El Paso, San Antonio. So that basically mean, means, uh, we had to travel at night because however hot it was outside, it gets hotter in the back of the truck. Cause there's, you know, there's no ventilation really. I mean, there's some, but, um, just by virtue of the fact that the door's not air, airtight, there's some, but it gets hot and stuffy in there. You're in a metal box. That's all it is, right? Um, so, you know, it's the main danger is from traffic accidents and everything, but if, you know, you could overheat in there. Thankfully, the time of year, it wasn't as hot, but by the time we got to Las Vegas, that time of year, or Phoenix, it was already like 95 degrees during the daytime. You know, we had just come from up in Montana. It was snowing. So long story short, we start traveling at night, sleeping during the daytime. And, um, and it was great. <laughs> that's, that's the thing about it all is that uh, a lot of people told us, you guys are real troopers for doing this, you know, on social media. And, um, it didn't feel that way. It just, um, it felt fun. It felt like, um, recapturing something that I would, I had loved so much and it almost wouldn't have been, it, you know, it wouldn't have been right if we hadn't had so many fuck ups and failures and, uh, if it hadn't all gone completely sideways. Um, we also had a lot of fun getting through the immigration checkpoint on I-10 on our way back to Texas. Um, because <laughs> you don't want to have people in the back of your, um, your cargo truck if you're going through one of those checkpoints because they'll know so we squeezed everyone into the front but yeah uh, when we got home i just immediately wanted to get back out on the road again i mean yeah, obviously i enjoyed coming home and seeing my wife amberly again and you know the cat was happy to see me and um you know sleeping in my own bed again but, um, you know, I kind of, I worried at the beginning that it would be, you know, it would be weird that I wouldn't slip right back into it again, that it wouldn't be the same, but it was the opposite. It was, uh, it was even better than I remembered it. And so I don't really know quite what to make of that because, um, I don't know if I'm just older or more mature. It felt a little bit more physically demanding, a little bit more punishing, or maybe I'm, maybe it's like the wisdom that comes with age is you just realize how much ordinary life is just absolute bullshit and any sort of reprieve from it is, um, incredible. And, um, so I don't know. I just wanted to tell you all, all about that because it's magical and the style of music I play heavy metal music is very Dionysian. I know that's like some of you made like a rolled your eyes and made a jerk off motion in the air when I said that, but, um, you know, not all sorts of music, uh, open up to this sort of reckless abandonment of the self. And there's still some people out there who want to go see live music and have that experience. And you can have that experience at, you know, um, a punk rock show, a metal show. I mean, like people who go listen to people will talk trash about like dance music or house music or whatever. I guess no one probably calls it house music anymore. I don't know. <laughs> But, you know, that's also reckless abandonment to dance, right? And um, I don't know. I, I'm sure I'll talk about this more uh, when we talk about Birth of Tragedy, but this is, and I've talked about it, I guess, in the Q&A, um, or I've been asked it before, but that's one of the things that brought me to Nietzsche was seeing how he had sort of seen that element in artwork uh, or in, in, in an art form all the way back in ancient Greece and put into words things that I had perceived but didn't have the words for or hadn't really been looking to have the words for. Um, it made sense of it all, right? That th this is a, you know, <laughs> it, it feels so um, profound and ecstatic and rapturous when you're at like a heavy metal show and you think, I don't know, in modern times, we just have this urge at always to trivialize it, right? And dismiss it and say, oh, well, that's just a physiological reaction to 
X, Y, and Z, or it's just mere entertainment, right? This is what people do for entertainment. But I'd felt that breaking through to something, and you feel that that resonance, that communion with the audience, that um, sharing of your emotional state that you're bringing them into, and it does feel like something sacred and ritualistic and um, important, more important perhaps than the financial incentives or the social status offered by such a life would imply from an, uh, maybe an objective perspective, right? It really is kind of actually a crazy thing to do. Um, there's a, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, there's a, there's a certain madness that you have to have to want to do that, to want to get into a, to a space barely larger than a prison cell with three or four or five other people and spend a month with them, uh, driving to a different city every single night and playing in dingy clubs and making no money usually because no matter how good you do, there's usually some calamity like this. Um, and even a lot of the greats don't make that much money because the bigger you are as an artist, the bigger your expenses, the more extravagant your performance gets, the more people you have to pay, the more you have to pay the venue. And uh, a lot of those people end up making bad financial decisions and uh, fame isn't all it's cracked up to be, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I count my lucky stars. I guess I'll just, I'll end on that note. And because uh, I remember seeing that, it was, I think it was in the documentary 20 Feet from Stardom. It's a movie about backup singers. Great film. If you're interested in music or the music industry at all, or just want to see great singing, and like an insight into an element of a lot of popular, like, you know, classic rock and soul and stuff, uh, 20 feet from stardom, but, and I might be completely mixing this up because I'm, I'm drawing a blank on who said it, but it was some famous musician. I think it was Sting. I, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up. I don't know. I just remember hearing an interview with some famous musician saying, talking about how they kind of wish they could go back to the days when they were just playing in clubs and the realization that at a certain level of fame and repute, you, you can't even do that anymore. It's why uh, popular artists will play shows under fake or assumed names and pseudonyms just to be able to go play a show in a club again. And it's like, why would you do that? Uh, from, from, again, from that objective standpoint, I could see someone saying, what? I mean, yeah, it seems fun, but... Isn't it better to fill up arenas? And I just try to be grateful for it, that it's um, grateful that I have not been cursed with fame, as someone like Lao Tzu might have said in the Tao Te Ching, that um, I've had this uh, wonderful uh, privilege in my life. So that's all everyone i just wanted to tell you the story of uh what happened to me over the past couple weeks when i was gone and because i thought it might be fun to talk about in story form and talk about why i love it and what i do and what better episode to bring that in than the episode on music all right um good night everyone i'm gonna sign off If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.